Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lawrence. I'm head of research and development at Chainlink Labs. Uh, and yeah, today I'm excited to tell you about improving the Oracle infrastructure uh, on Ethereum. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Oracle infrastructure connects smart contracts with the rest of the world, with the world outside the blockchain. And so let me start by talking about the most prominent use case of Oracle's data feeds. Um, I'll start by reading a quote. We'll play a little game. You guys can, while I read the quote, guess where the quote is from. I'll give you a few more seconds after I'm done reading the quote, and then I'll reveal the answer. So the quote is, for example, one powerful use case of an Oracle contract would be a hedging contract, where A and B put in $1,000 worth of Bitcoin, and after 30 days, the script sends $1,000 worth of Bitcoin to A and the rest to B. This would require an Oracle to determine the value of one Bitcoin in US dollars. Sounds a little bit like DeFi. The terminology is a bit different from what we would say today. So the solution is it comes from the Ethereum white paper all the way back in 2014. So already back then, uh, it was clear that oracles are required for certain types of applications. And indeed, here we have an example of a you know, price feed or data feed oracle. And if we think a little bit about the properties that this implies that we need our oracle to have, there's two things that stand out. So first of all, we need reliability. We need to make sure that um, when the 30 days are up here, indeed, the Oracle supplies the exchange rate between Bitcoin and dollars, so we can fairly settle the hedging contract. Um, and then we also need security and integrity, right? The price that is provided here by the Oracle will be used to settle the contract. And so if the price is incorrect, then we won't be able to settle the contract fairly. So it's essential um, that we, we have an Oracle that provides these properties. Um, and I think uh, if, we, if we think about the history since then, billions of dollars have been stolen in Oracle manipulation attacks. So Oracle security is paramount for DeFi. So let's have a look at how one might construct such a data feed Oracle. Um, and I'll start with a straw man construction, and then I'll evolve that construction into what I would say is the state of the art today, uh, and is what, what Chainlink does today. So here in the straw man example, uh, we have um, a data source that pro, you know, the Oracle observes. In this case, the data source says, hey, $10 is the price. Uh, the Oracle will sign. Uh, that price, and it will then provide it uh, to a contract running on chain, and then a DAP contract can read the price from our data feed contract. Uh, but if we think a little bit about the two properties I had just mentioned, reliability and security, then this system does not achieve them because we have a single point of failure. If this oracle goes down or fails to provide the price, then the system on chain won't work. And similarly, if the single oracle here is compromised or malicious, then it can feed a false price uh, to the contract on chain and cause the contract to be settled incorrectly, unfairly. So how can we solve this problem? Well, there's a few different approaches that people commonly take, but I think the most common one today is to say, let's decentralize the Oracle. Uh, so let's have a bunch of independent Oracles all provide the system together. And so what we've done here is we now have multiple Oracles uh, that each fetch a price from a data source and then um, send uh, their individual signed observations to a contract running on chain. Uh, and that contract on chain stores the observations until there's a sufficient number of them, then aggregates them into a single price using a robust aggregation um, for, for these data feeds. The typical aggregation one would use for numerical data is to take the median, because that's a robust statistic that doesn't respond to, for example, false outlier values or things like that. And then, you know, once we have medianized our value, we can expose it to the DAP contract downstream. And this is nice because we can now handle subsets of oracles being faulty, right? So if some of the oracles here do not send a price, um, or if some of them send false data, that's OK. Uh, if, they, if they don't send a price, our data feed contract can just handle that by ignoring a certain number of missing submissions. Uh, and if they send a false price, as I had mentioned, we use the median, which is a robust statistic, uh, and which ensures that as long as um, no more than half of the oracles here are faulty, uh, the aggregate price still lies within the interval uh, of prices reported by correct oracles. Um, so this works well in terms of giving us the security properties and reliability properties we want. But there's a problem here, right? Um, if you're familiar with smart contract development, notice that uh, we're sending one transaction per oracle here. We store the submissions in state, and we compute an aggregate on chain, all of which are expensive things to do. Um, and indeed, this is how Chainlink used to work in the past with a system called Flux Monitor. Um, and indeed, that became prohibitively expensive. 
And so we moved on to the next generation, which I'll describe now. So I would say that the state of the art then is to say, let's move as much work as possible off-chain. The less we need to touch the chain, the more efficient our system is going to be. But we'll want to do this in a way that preserves the security and reliability properties that we desire. Um, and so, so roughly speaking, what we do here is we, we again have our oracles observing prices from, from uh, their respective data sources. Uh, but now we have the oracles communicate with one another using a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network. Um, and we, for the distributed systems folks out here, um, have them run a Byzantine fault-tolerant protocol. Byzantine fault-tolerant means that they can handle arbitrary faults. So any of these oracles could be you know, malicious or faulty or down or whatever else. And as long as you know, some subset of them uh, is affected by this, depending on exactly how you set up the assumptions, either less than a third or less than half of the oracles, the overall system will keep functioning correctly. Chainlink's version of this is called the off-chain reporting protocol. Um, and indeed, it's far more efficient than the predecessor I had just showed you. So we realized something like 90% on-chain cost savings. Um, and this is good for security, because it means that with the same security budget, we can have a lot more oracles. Um, so we can tolerate more faulty oracles uh, in the system. And it's also good for reliability, because in this system, um, at the end of the off-chain protocol, every oracle ends up with an identical copy of the report, which is signed by a quorum of the oracles. And the contract will then validate uh, that the report is indeed signed by a quorum of the oracles. And what this means is that as long as a single oracle is able to get a transaction on chain, um, the, the overall system will keep functioning correctly. Um, and so, for example, during times of chain congestion, uh, this is very desirable. Indeed, as I mentioned, right, this is how, how the uh, chain link uh, off-chain reporting protocol works. Um, and it's been, it's been very successful. So we, we designed it for powering data feeds on EVM chains. Uh, it's been running reliably and securely for, at this point, one and a half years in production. It secures roughly $20 billion of value across all the various chains that Chainlink is active on, uh, $14 billion just on Ethereum. Um, there's more than 1,000 feeds across all the chains we're active on, and more than 290 of those are on Ethereum. Uh, and I think the, the reliability and security of the system are also shown by the fact that we have major, major DeFi protocols uh, relying on this system. Uh, Brand, like names such as Aave, Compound, and Synthetix uh, all use this. Cool. But OK, so I told you about data feeds. But now I want to tell you that oracles are about a lot more than just data feeds. Um, they enable, in the general sense, um, interactions of smart contracts with the outside world. Um, that is to say, you know, things that are outside the blockchain a contract executes on. And so they empower smart contracts to reach their full potential because now I can do a lot more interesting things with my contract um, than, than if I'm just isolated on the blockchain and cannot interact with the outside world. So here are some of the capabilities um, that are enabled uh, by, by oracles. Um, data feeds I just talked about, um, proof of reserve. Uh, I can ensure that on-chain assets are sufficiently collateralized by uh, some off-chain reserve of funds, by having independent oracles monitor that reserve of funds and report uh, how, how large the collateral is. Um, secure randomness, contract automation, and cross-chain interoperability, I'm going to talk about more later in the talk, so I won't go into them now. Um, fair sequencing, you know, I can use an Oracle network to protect users from toxic MEV extraction by fairly sequencing transactions. Uh, I can outsource computation and storage um, so that I can enable contracts to scale beyond what the EVM provides. As much as we all love the EVM and as much fun as gas golfing is, there are some things that are just a little bit hard to do on the EVM. Um, and then finally, uh, I can also um, enable oracles to perform real-world actions. So we actually had a hackathon a couple of months ago inside Chainlink Labs uh, where we had contracts ordering pizza uh, via the Pizza Hut API to people's houses. Um, so I think that's a, that's a pretty neat use case that is enabled here and that would not be uh, available to contracts natively. And then finally, uh, we can also provide privacy-preserving access to almost any Web 2.0 data. And I'll cover that also towards the end of my talk. So this gives rise to this notion of hybrid smart contracts. And, and when I say hybrid smart contract, what I mean here is a um, hybrid system that partly operates on-chain in the form of a smart contract running, say, on Ethereum, and partly off-chain, um, operated by a network of, of decentralized oracles. Um, and so this overall hybrid smart contract is now able to interact with the real world. 
Um, and so, so this enables me to do all sorts of interesting things. Um, and, and let me you know, give you some more specific details on some of these. Um, and I'll start by talking a bit about secure randomness and what that enables contracts to do. As you're probably familiar, there's kind of two on-chain native ways on Ethereum these days uh, to get random values. One of them is the block hash opcode. Uh, and that's sort of you know, audit findings 101. Do not rely on the block hash opcode for randomness. Uh, any block producer can, can easily tamper with that. Uh, and now, since the merge, there's also a second opcode, prevrandau, which is a little bit better than block hash, but which is still manipulable um, by block producers. Um, and so, so the output of both of these can be biased. So if your contract needs secure randomness, for example, for running a lottery um, or uh, for you know, doing an uh, NFT mint where you assign valuable random attributes to your NFTs, um, these are not good enough. And so on-chain, there is no native capability to get good randomness. And this is where oracles come in, and oracles can provide that functionality. Um, so uh, we, we have a um, cryptographic construct here that's called a verifiable random function. Um, and that enables an oracle to provide tamper-proof randomness. And let me explain how that works. Um, so we start here with our DAP contract um, that, if it wants some randomness, can request from another contract on chain that's part of this VRF service um, some random words. Uh, the contract will emit an event um, with uh, you know, just telling the oracles that randomness has been requested. Uh, the oracles will evaluate um, the verifiable random function, which is based on deterministic public key cryptography. That is to say, the oracles actually have no ability to change the output. It's deterministic. So based on a given key pair and a given blockchain state, uh, which is used as the input for the VRF, we will always get the same output value, the same randomly distributed output value. And uh, the oracles will then provide a cryptographic proof that they correctly evaluated the VRF. We'll send that cryptographic proof to our coordinator contract here, which can cryptographically verify the proof. And if indeed the verification succeeds, then finally the coordinator can uh, send the, the uh, random output here to the DAP contract, which can then, for example, run its lottery or whatever else. Um, and this is live today in production. If you are writing a contract and you need this functionality, you can use it. And I think there's over 1,400 unique contracts that have used this uh, in the past 30 days. So OK, randomness is cool. Uh, now let me talk to you about yet another use case that is live today uh, and that you know, enables contracts to do more interesting things. And that is contract automation. Uh, once again, I'll return to the quote from the original Ethereum white paper in 2014. But this time, I'll highlight a different part. Uh, so here we have, after 30 days, the script sends $1,000 worth of Bitcoin uh, to A and the rest to B. So how does the script do this? How can the script or the smart contract send those funds to A and B? Contracts do not have an ability to initiate their own execution, right? And of course, I could say, well, you know, I'll just have my users A or B here um, you know, call the contract after the 30 days are up, and then I'll do a payout. And maybe if I just have two users, that's fine. But now let's say I have a lot of users, uh, or I want to you know, sweep a bunch of tokens from different uh, contracts into a single pool, or whatever other expensive maintenance action my system requires to run, then that will lead to a very poor UX if I put the onus of performing those maintenance actions on the users interacting with my DAP. Um, because if I'm a user, I now have a non-deterministic gas price. Right? Once in a while, when I interact with a DAP, it's going to cost me 100,000 gas. Another time, I need to maintain some expensive maintenance on the side, and suddenly it's going to cost me 500,000 gas. That's not great. It's also unreliable, because I can't really rely on my users calling the contract at a specific point in time. And so this is where, where contract automation comes into play. So once again here, we have a set of oracles or automation nodes um, that are monitoring the chain. And the upkeep contract here is the, the DAP contract. Um, and the upkeep contract is just any regular smart contract written in Solidity or Viper or whatever programming language you prefer. And it has a special function called check upkeep. Um, and that function will be evaluated by our Oracle network here uh, whenever a new block is mined. But it will be evaluated in a simulated environment using the, say, fcall RPC uh, endpoint of, a, of an Ethereum node. So we never hit the chain. Uh, with, with these evaluations. No transaction lands on chain. And so we can call this on every block without incurring any cost. Um, and so then the, you know, the programmer of this upkeep contract can basically come up with any arbitrary predicate to decide whether their contract ought to be called or not. 
Um, and you know, if, if the contract says, no, I don't want to be called, no problem. We just check again in the next block. Um, but if, indeed, the contract wants to be called, it can indicate so to the Oracle network, which will then send a second, uh, or will then actually send the first real transaction to the chain that's not simulated um, with a perform upkeep call for our upkeep contract here. Uh, and now this uh, contract on chain can you know, take whatever logic it wants to. So for example, in the previous case, uh, at this point, it could have paid out uh, our two users, A and B, uh, depending on the outcome of this hedging contract. And again, this functionality is live today. Um, there's over 250 unique upkeep contracts that have been active in the past 30 days. Um, and if that's useful for your, for your smart contracts, then I would encourage you to check that out. OK, so I've been talking a bunch about data feeds and about other uh, Oracle capabilities that are live today. But I'm from research, right? So I'm particularly excited about the future uh, and, and what uh, future capabilities we're actively working on um, to bring to market. Um, and I'm going to present two exciting capabilities, and both of them are in an alpha stage with partners. So uh, both of them are, are already working in some form, even though they're not quite ready for, for mainnet production yet. And the, the first of these is cross-chain interoperability. Um, so the problem here is that smart contracts cannot natively interact uh, with smart contracts running on other blockchains. Um, but we live in a multi-chain world now, right? There's dozens of chains out there. It's a very heterogeneous environment. Some are L1s, some are L2s, some use the EVM, some don't, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, indeed, there's also a lot of demand for bridging uh, between contracts on different chains. So uh, to date, something like $168 billion of value have been bridged. Just in the past 12 months, we've seen over two-thirds of the total volume ever bridged for something like $115 billion bridged. Um, but also, we have a challenge with security in this cross-chain space. So to date, $2.5 billion have been hacked from cross-chain protocols. Um, and just this year, over 70% of all value stolen uh, in, in kind of the blockchain ecosystem is from cross-chain hacks. Uh, so I think, once again, this indicates that security is paramount, uh, but that, unfortunately, the, the current solutions uh, are not yet up to the task. And so we at Chainlink are, are also working on a, on a solution to this problem, uh, which we call the Cross-Chain uh, Interoperability Protocol, CCIP. Um, and so here, we're working on a, on a programmable bridge um, that enables a smart contract, that contract here, say, on Ethereum, to send a message to a contract running on some other chain. Um, and it, you know, it could be talking to multiple other chains. So here I have it sending a message from Ethereum uh, to this other chain, B. Um, and the message can carry both data, so some kind of arbitrary binary payload, as well as value, so say tokens. Um, and again, I need oracles for this, uh, because inherently the other chain B or Ethereum have no way of knowing what happened uh, on their counterpart chain that they want to talk to here. Uh, and so oracles can, can bridge that gap, um, and they can uh, transport information uh, about what happened on one chain to another chain to enable contracts on different chains to interoperate. Um, this is, again, you know, as, as I mentioned, it's very important that this, done, that this is done securely, because if for some reason here I were to get uh, you know, false information about what message was uh, created on Ethereum, uh, then that could, for example, lead to, to funds being moved uh, on this other chain here when they shouldn't be, and I would have a security breach. Um, if you want to learn more details about this, uh, we just had a talk at SmartCon roughly two weeks ago where we went in more detail about the architecture of CCIP. And it's on YouTube, so I'd encourage you to check that out if it's interesting to you. The second um, Oracle-enabled capability for the future that we're working on is about providing privacy-preserving access to Web 2.0 data, to almost any Web 2.0 data, uh, to smart contracts. And this is, I think, a super cool capability. At first, it sounds a bit unreal, like, how does this work? How, how could this be? So let me, let me show you um, what, I, what I mean here. Um, so the, the fundamental problem is that the, the vast majority of data is private and is therefore not publicly accessible in the Web 2.0 ecosystem. So for example, my online bank account, my Twitter profile, my Facebook profile, my Amazon account, some government website, none of these are accessible by smart contracts on chain because all of them are behind some kind of authentication wall, right? And I would argue that's a good thing. I don't want my bank account information to be just visible to any contract on chain. 
Um, but still, it would be kind of cool if there were a way to expose in a privacy-preserving information just the information required to smart contracts on chain, um, because that would unlock, I think, many interesting use cases, things like decentralized identity, risk scoring, where I can use information about my off-chain behavior to you know, score how risky of a borrower, say, I am, Consequent, uh, consequently under-collateralized lending, um, where you know, maybe in order to borrow $100 worth of assets, I don't have to put up $200 worth of collateral on-chain, um, or private DeFi instruments, where I can have a, a DeFi instrument where only the parties that are participating in that instrument uh, need to learn you know, what exactly the conditions of it are, on what, based on what condition it's settled, and so on, to improve privacy of on-chain trading. And more things that I probably can't even imagine yet. This is a very general technology. And so the technology we're working on here to, to address this is called DECO. Uh, DECO was originally researched at Cornell University and IC3, the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Contracts. Um, and since then, uh, Chainlink uh, has, uh, has pushed the project forward, um, is actively developing it, and, and further researching it uh, to make it efficient and practical. And so I'm briefly going to describe to you how DECO works and what properties it affords. Uh, first in the abstract, and then by going through an example. So we have three off-chain parties here. We have a web server, uh, we have a prover or a user, and we have a bunch of uh, verifiers or oracles. Um, and so now what, what DECO enables the user to do is to prove to these verifiers, and then by extension to the smart contract, um, that some data indeed comes from a certain web server. So for example, I can show that indeed bank.com made some statement. We assume that this web server runs TLS, which is the, the standard protocol for securing communications on the web today. Uh, you know, whenever you go to some website, uh, you'll probably see a little lock uh, icon in your address bar indicating that the connection is secured with TLS. So I can prove provenance. So I can show that the data indeed comes from a certain source. But I can do this in a privacy-preserving way, um, where I can run a zero-knowledge proof protocol to only reveal the information, the minimal information that I want to reveal to the verifiers, uh, and then by extension again to the contract. Um, and right, so, so the web server, obviously, if it's, for example, my bank, knows my balance and my password. Uh, I, as the user, also uh, know my, my password and my balance. Um, but the, the verifiers or oracles, um, for example, should definitely not learn my password, right? And DECO enables me to do this in this privacy-preserving way. Um, and then finally, and I think this is actually the coolest property of DECO, it's compatibility. So it's compatible with the existing TLS web ecosystem. Um, and that means that there's no need to get, for example, the, the data holder here, the web server, to change anything about their API or their stack. They don't even need to know that DECO is being used uh, to prove something. Um, and you know, if you, for example, look at how hard it is to get the internet migrated to IPv6, uh, you know that protocol upgrades are very difficult. Uh, so it's, I think, a, a game changer here that this works with the existing Web 2.0 ecosystem without requiring modifications on the part of the web server uh, or the user. So let me, let me show you an example. Um, so I'm the, I'm the prover, I'm the user here. My name's Lawrence, uh, and I want to show to a contract on chain that my bank account balance is greater than $1,000 without revealing anything on top of that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, connect using TLS, indicated by the green locks here, to the API of my bank using TLS. Uh, so I'm going to say, hey, I'm Lawrence. My password is Hunter2. What's my balance? Um, and now the, the bank API you know, will respond, hey, Lawrence, your balance is, say, $5,000, uh, which, remember, I do not want to reveal uh, to the verifiers or to the contract. Um, as part of the way the, the handshake works here between me and the banking API, um, I'm also able to, just as part of this TLS exchange, um, ensure that the verifiers or oracles here get a cryptographic commitment uh, to the data uh, that is being exchanged. And that commitment is, uh, as, as we say in cryptography, binding and hiding, which is to say that if I... So, so you can think about it as an envelope where I put some data inside. If you just have the envelope, you cannot see what's inside, uh, but you also cannot switch the contents without somebody noticing because you kind of tore the envelope. And this is basically a similar thing here. So uh, the verifiers hold a cryptographic commitment about any data that was exchanged within the session. So I, as the user, um, cannot sort of alter the data after the fact. But the verifiers do not see what's inside the commitment. The commitment is hiding. 
So they have not learned at this point any private information, any information at all um, about what was in the TLS session. And so now we get to the final step, uh, which here I'm abbreviating with ZKP magic because I have like two minutes left on this talk. Um, but the, the way this works is that we now run an interactive zero knowledge uh, proof protocol between the prover user, so myself, and these oracles. And as part of that ZKP protocol, I can convince the oracles um, cryptographically that indeed, for example, this statement holds, so that my balance is greater than $1,000. But that is the only thing they will learn. They will not learn my credentials, and they will not learn my precise balance. Uh, the oracles can then uh, cryptographically sign an attestation that they have successfully uh, verified this zero-knowledge proof. And this attestation can be forwarded to our smart contract on chain here. Uh, again, you know, signed by a Chrome of oracles, and then we can verify in the contract that indeed uh, those, those signatures match. Uh, and so now I have convinced a contract on chain that I have you know, at least $1,000 in my contract. Uh, and I've done that without having revealed any additional information. Um, and and you, know, you can think about this in a far more general sense, because this zero knowledge proof, I could basically prove almost any statement um, about the data that was exchanged in almost any TLS session. So this is a very general and very powerful technology, I believe. And I'm, yeah, I'm excited to see what people are actually going to build with it. Because I think due to its generality, I personally have a hard time imagining what's going to be enabled by it. Um, so yeah, um, thanks a lot for, for listening to my talk. Um, there, is, there is three things um, I'd, I'd like you to, to take away. So first of all, security and reliability are paramount for oracles. Um, second of all, um, oracles are about a lot more than just data feeds. I think I've shown you a bunch of exciting applications um, of what um, oracles can, can do. Um, yeah, and third of all, I think we, we yeah, have an have a opportunity to make contracts more exciting, more interesting, to empower them to reach their full potential uh, beyond just doing things within the closed on-chain uh, ecosystem that they would naturally operate in without the aid of oracles. So yeah, thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, uh, I think I'm, I'm over time. So just uh, come and find me after the talk. And I'd love you to chat. You have time, actually. You have time, mm, actually. Sorry? There's time allotted for your Q&A. So there's room for questions right now. In Please contract see. automation, uh, how are the gas fees paid? Ah, I see, I see, I see. So basically, what happens is that the, the DAP that relies on contract automation um, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll maintain um, a balance. I don't know whether I can go back to that slide. No, 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 no more. Anyway, so, so it maintains a subscription balance with an automation registry contract that sits on chain. And then when the DAP is invoked by the Oracle network, um, that automation registry will keep track of how much gas is used as part of that transaction, the perform upkeep transaction, and will, you know, Bill the user's subscription for that. So, um, and, and when I say the user here, I mean the, the upkeep contract. Um, so, so in that sense, as long as the subscription is funded, uh, we will just automatically you know, have the contract deduct the, the price of the upkeep from that. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. So, so you showed that, that diagram where yeah. uh, the user and the bank API exchange that ma those messages, right? So this is about Deco, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, too bad we can't show the slide. Yeah. yeah, OK. So the bank says that the balance is 5,000. And uh, Oracle sees that, but without seeing the balance, right? And then so the, the Oracle does not see the, the, the $5,000. Yeah. Right? The Oracle just has a cryptographic commitment against which we can then perform an interactive zero knowledge Yeah, proof. exactly. I'm just wondering how the Oracle then can verify that the balance is over 1,000 without like, showing that the balance is 5,000, right? Because uh -huh. the exchange was only like, containing information about 5,000 and not about like, 1,000, right? Right, so, so my, my short answer, and, and forgive me, is just going to be magic's your knowledge proofs. Um, basically, that's what ZKPs are about, right? I can, I can prove statements about data in sort of very counterintuitive ways without revealing anything beyond the statement. Um, but I think we probably don't have time to go into the details of how that works, unfortunately. But come find me afterwards, and I'm happy to talk more. Uh, so I have a question about the OCR, the off-chain uh, 
Oracle reporting protocol. Uh -huh. So with, uh, with blockchain, uh, it's easy for the different nodes to reach consensus, right? Because they can check the, uh, uh, the transaction signature, they can rerun, rerun all the bytecode of a smart contract. But with the Oracle, uh, how does the different node reach a consensus? Because uh, uh, if, it's a, if it's a data fit, then uh, it, you cannot compute, right? You cannot compute whether data fit is correct or not. So, so I believe that the answer to your question is OCR is a Byzantine fault tolerant protocol. Uh -huh. That is actually the same family of protocols that consensus protocols are from, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it uses similar techniques. It just has a different goal. Its goal is to provide uh, you know, reliable and secure reports about some you know, data observed from off-chain to contracts on-chain. Um, but it's, it's similar techniques, and so um, you, you kind of, as part of how that protocol works, uh, get that property that you know, the oracles communicate with each other over the peer-to-peer -peer network, and that some of them can be faulty and so on. So you, you, know, you, you broadcast things, you converge cast things, you use digital signatures, the, the usual type of things you would do in, in BFT protocols. Yeah, uh, I mean, if, uh, let, let's say if it's Ethereum or if it's other blockchain, uh, a different nodes just, ha just have to have a sim similar result uh, from the trans executing the transaction, have a similar result. If a two third, two third of a node have a similar result, then can reach a consensus, right? But, but with, uh, I, I understand with, uh, I, you can use that for the, for the consensus layer, but, uh, uh, how could you have Byzantine fault tolerance for the, for the data field, right? Data field. For example, if one node say the, the price of Ethereum is 1,000, another node say the, the price of Ethereum is 2,000, uh, you, you cannot, uh, how, can, how, can, how can them reach the consensus? I, I think what you're asking is how we reliably aggregate the data in in, inside OCR. Is that correct? No, uh, for like for computation for computation task, it's very easy to reach a consensus between different computers because as long as your as as long as the re, uh, result or computation is the same, if two third two third of no uh, computer agreed like. Uh, the result of the computation result wow. of one transaction is the same, then you have a consensus, you are, you are fine, you are good. But uh, uh, with the data fit, like let's say if, uh, if, two, if one sort of a uh, server or node, Chainlink node think uh, the, the price of Ethereum is uh, 1,000. I see, I see, I think, I think now I get the question. Okay, so, so basically inside the, the OCR protocol, which I did not have time to explain in detail here, uh -huh. uh, there is a phase where, where the different oracles um, converge cast their individual observations to each other. Uh, and at the end of that phase, every oracle will have a signed observation from every other oracle. So if you know, we have a bunch of oracles in here, every oracle will know what all the other oracles think the price should be. Um, and at that point, I can then you know, have everybody compute the same kind of deterministic aggregation function, and I will end up with the same outputs, and so I can reach agreement between the different oracles. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.